Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Midnight Matinee. Just when you thought you were out, we pulled you back in. I'm Mark. I'm Craig. And unfortunately, I'm still here. <laughs> <laughs> On this episode of the Midnight Matinee, a review of The American, starring George Clooney. But first up, some movie news. First up on movie news, it's been reported that director M. Night Shyamalan has decided to rework his idea for a sequel to Unbreakable into an original feature to be the second part of his Night Chronicles series. How arrogant is that, calling it Night Chronicles? <laughs> like, really? They're, they're going to be... They're all going to have that in the front of them? I mean, I guess not. Devil doesn't. So, that's just something he's calling it in his own private moments? <laughs> or to the press? You know, I used so. to think... Uh, I used to think M. Night Shyamalan was pretty good, and... I mean, his earlier work can't really be berated because it was pretty awesome. But I think, I think he really his head got too big for his for his shoulders, and he started thinking that he can, that whatever ideas he comes up with, um, you know, that it's it translates to gold on paper. And basically, everything that he's done since the village, it seems like he takes it on in a very unilateral way and it's almost pretentious to see the credits roll up on screen or directed produced written you know con starring con <laughs> yes yeah. starring con conceived yeah uh, I mean and now from the mind of you know from the birth canal of M. Night Shyamalan <laughs> what the hell any of that means and also, he puts himself in the movie as a pivotal role that actually changes Mel Gibson. Like that—that's the reason Mel Gibson strays away from the cloth. It's like, really, you did that. You're a dick. <laughs> so you caused the central problem in your own movie. Mm. Yeah. How foretelling. At least Alfred Hitchcock had the decency to limit his cameos to a simple walk-on of his shiny chrome dome and left it at that. Yes. So. Yeah, he didn't insist on playing Norman Bates. Second, Fox, who are uh, planning uh, to reboot the Fantastic Four franchise, are planning on casting Bruce Willis in the role of The Thing as his voice. They're going to CGI him as a character. <laughs> I think that's a pretty good idea. Bruce Willis brings a very average Joe uh, feel to the part, which is what Ben Grimm's supposed to be all about. <laughs> yippee ki -yay, motherfucker. It's clobbering time. <laughs> Mother motherfucker. You gotta add a curse Those are both phrases that people Willis. say. <laughs> yes, they are. It's because it's the thing and it's Bruce Willis. And then you have to mix two movies together to make it funny. Or you could not do that and just make the Fantastic Four. Which sucked the first time. And anything that includes Bruce Willis is, autom is an automatic awesome. Mm -hmm. Except for some of the movies that he made, like Surrogates. <laughs> well, that the Fifth sucked. Element, that Hudson That's Hawk, <laughs> Bonfire of the Vanities. I like Hudson Hawk. But of course you Danny would. Aiello! He's got a thing for Danny Aiello. Jerks off to the last Don. <laughs> oh, God. Due to the runaway success of Kick-Ass on DVD, Kick-Ass 2 has just been greenlit. Yeah, Matthew Vaughn wants to call the sequel Kick-Ass 2 Balls to the Wall, which is a pretty awesome title. The original Kick-Ass film, I felt, was imaginative and daring in a way that few films, uh, or filmmakers for that matter, are usually willing to go. Um, you know, especially reading by a lot of what uh, the critics out there had to say, and even from my own opinions, it certainly raises a few uh, ethical questions and, you know, and just some gray areas there, too. Um, and it, but it also certainly challenges our perception of what's acceptable in the way we view uh, the acts of violence as, as uh, perpetrated by children. But uh, all in all, it made for quite a fantastic film. <laughs> um, you know, the action was just brilliant, of course, and uh, it's not often that you get to see a nine-year-old girl <laughs> decapitating bad guys with the scythe. 
Yeah. I see no ethical dilemma there. I think all children should take up arms against organized crime. <laughs> <laughs> Next up, DVD recommendations. My recommendation this week is Demolition Man, an underrated movie from the early 90s with Sylvester Stallone and Wesley Snipes. Stallone plays a particularly violent police officer who's uh, put into a cryogenically frozen state as a prison sentence and thought out in the future to recapture Wesley Snipes as arch nemesis from the 90s. Now, the reason this movie is so great, in my opinion, is that it shows what will happen if uh, the PC culture that's uh, becoming such a potent force in this country is allowed to take over completely. <coughs> Forces from the far left and the far right both get their way and get to ban everything they don't like, and as a result, nobody's allowed to have any fun or be human at all. The left gets to ban red meat, cigarettes, salt and the right gets to ban sex and well that's all they really care about is banning sex <laughs> i really i really enjoyed demolition man plus the action was really great yeah. and um the three c <laughs> i still want to know what the three c shells do <laughs> i know fortunately i've never seen demolition man but i am a huge fan of sylvester stallone as uh our last episode would certainly imply so uh it has my full endorsement in that respect. The DVD I'm going to recommend is Titan A.E., a very underrated and an underappreciated movie. I mean, you know, not to beat a dead horse, but uh, it was both those things. The story is about the Earth getting destroyed by an alien, a malevolent alien race called the Dreg. And now Earth and the remaining humans from Earth are drifters uh, throughout space. And... Kale, voiced by Matt Damon, is now as then thrown into a search to help find the Titan built by his father. It's a really good movie, has a, a lot of great action scenes, really good dialogue, uh, has a lot of heart, especially with the alien species. You know, you wouldn't expect uh, a human uh, nature from these different alien species that are all on this ship. And uh, the relationship between the, the crew members as a uh, you really see it throughout the whole and actually uh, throughout the whole entire movie, and you see it their relationship actually grow, and uh, definitely should check it out. So it's a damn good. Uh, it's an animated feature, but it's 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 a it's a damn good one. The movie I would like to recommend is The Godfather Part Three, the final chapter in Mario Puzo's saga of the Corleone family, as brought to the screen by Francis Ford Coppola, starring Al Pacino, Andy Garcia. Talia Shire, etc., etc. In my opinion, I feel that part three is often maligned and usually for very poor reasons. And in fact, I think it brings some much needed closure that wasn't particularly afforded in the second part. The story, of course, is the story, of course, surrounds Don Michael Corleone, who is ever trying to legitimize his family, ultimately find, fi uh, and ultimately finding resistance at uh, every turn. As he quite famously says in the film, every time he thinks that he's out, they pull him right back in. In The Godfather Part 3, you also have Al Pacino in many moments, what I personally consider to be some of the finest performance of his career, though the film usually as a whole uh, has been often disregarded. The ending is one of the most powerful I think I've seen in any gangster film to date, uh, beautifully expressing the tragedy of the, this entire uh, lifestyle. Anyone who gets drawn into it, inevitably it never ends well for them. And uh, you know, I'm not sitting here to say that the third film was as as masterful as the first two, but I think it's a brilliant and wonderful film on its own merit. And anybody who is a genuine fan of the Godfather series should enjoy it. I really like the Godfather 3 too. I think I might disagree to an extent that uh, the uh, second film uh, needed closure because I like the way that it ended with Michael just completely alone in the cold. But I do still appreciate the fact the third movie 
uh, went further with his life and showed what happened later. Mm -hmm. Next up, a review of the American. Not a real gun. The American, directed by Anton Corbin, is about an assassin who's being targeted by a mysterious enemy and is given a low-key assignment in a small Italian town to supply another assassin with a long-range rifle for her to complete an assignment. While he's there, he tries to make a human connection that his cold, ruthless job normally won't allow him to make. Well, it was definitely one of the most beautifully shot movies I've, I've seen in a while. Uh, the land, the Italian landscapes, uh, just the way he framed everything, it was just, everything was for a reason, right? that's the reason why he did it. And I have to say, I couldn't wait for the next landscape shop, even though it was just him driving around on, on the Italian countryside, I still, I still liked seeing those shots because they were just so beautiful. Well, as I think has been, uh, has probably been expressed before, it certainly, uh, is a type of film that's uh, been told before, but it's been told exceedingly well. Uh, better than a lot of films um, in this genre of recent history. I think a lot of critics today unfairly use originality as a criterion by which to automatically knock down fi uh, you know, uh, films by, by two stars. Like anything that is to them, you know, anything that comes across a, as uh, remotely familiar or having been told in some capacity, uh, some capacity before, it for whatever reason doesn't immediately sit well with them. And I think this is a particularly unfair stance uh, to take because just because it's been told before doesn't always mean it's been told well. And I think with the American that holds particularly true. I agree. I thought it was an, a very well-told story, and uh, I love the idea of this guy who's had to live his entire life detached from humanity, and now all he wants to do is find someone to connect with. Uh, he made an attempt uh, before he, had, he came to this town, and it failed miserably. He does everything he can to keep himself away from that by... Uh, you know, satisfying his sexual urges with prostitutes, <laughs> but he still cannot help, he still cannot suppress his own humanity, and then it becomes uh, his quest to finally embrace it. And while not all of us are clandestine assassins who build custom rifles for clients, I think, I, <laughs> I, think, I think there are some very human themes as uh, as my illustrious co-host pointed out, I'm that illustrious. We, <laughs> that we can all take that uh, America. That we can all relate to. Some of the the, the final the, some of the sequences uh, with other other assassins following him, and he's being followed, or whatever whatever's going on in the scenes is uh, it's a very cat and mouse, and it's it's so shot so well, and you have that. Feeling in the pit of your stomach, like, what's going to happen next? He's taking a different route. What's going to happen? Oh my god, he's going to get shot. It's not a James Bond film by any stretch of the imagination. To, uh, by, you know, to some fault uh, of the trailers, which made it out to seem that way. Yeah, there was a wonderful shot in this film at the beginning where uh, George Clooney is walking down this uh, long staircase, uh, you know, different parts of the stairwell, and on top is uh, the priest looking down on him. And there are no cuts or anything, it just frames the entire thing in that scene. And it really looked wonderful, and most, uh, most of uh, the movies that are filmed today would have a bunch of cuts in that scene. But uh, the fact that they just let it all play out, uh, <clears throat> you know, I really appreciated that. No shaky cam. Huh. Yeah, action scenes weren't born style. Who to thunk? Even though the action scenes were few, they were brutal. Very, very brutal. So certainly not one for the kids. So. No. <laughs> They'd be bored to tears. <laughs> Especially with the sex scenes. They'd be bored. Well, that does it for this episode of the Midnight Matinee, and as always, questions or comments down below. And leave us an email at tmmatinee at gmail.com. Do Thanks all of those things. Thanks for watching.